Okay, welcome. Welcome to our roundtable this afternoon. My name is Margaret Laracy. I'll be moderating the discussion. We're in a critical moment in the Catholic Church. Inundated with stories of abuse and corruption, there's deep distrust of authority, and there are a plethora of calls for new plans and programs. I'm a clinical psychologist, and in my field, particularly in the U.S., there's a tremendous focus on strategies to ameliorate symptoms short-term practical treatments. But very often the underlying dynamics that drive symptoms go unaddressed. And almost never is the nature of the person who comes to treatment suffering explored. In turn, symptoms and maladaptive patterns repeat. That's not what we want today. <laughs> today we want to explore some of the pressing questions that vibrate beneath the current crisis. To understand better, the situation in which we find ourselves today, and to seek a genuinely human and a genuinely Christian path forward. So we want to take up some of these questions. How do we educate our youth? How is one educated to be an adult Christian person? And what is the value of this education? What is the role of the lay person in the church and the church in today's society? We will engage with these issues through the life experience of Father Luigi Giussani, an Italian priest and educator who died in 2005. In the 1950s, Giussani recognized that a crisis of faith was already present beneath the flourishing of Catholicism in Italy. Rather than pursuing a theological career, Giussani asked to teach in a public high school in order to help young people rediscover Christianity's essential elements and the relevance of Christ to life's needs and the original yearnings of every human heart. Giussani invited his students and later the many adults who would also follow him to compare everything that happened around them and in their lives to the needs of their own heart. Through him, a charism and the people was born. Communion and liberation, or CL, is a companionship inspired by his thought and experience, and the name describes its presence in the world. An ecclesial experience of faith in God, lived in communion, which is the person's liberation. Today we want to see how this man, Luigi Giussani, and the communal experience that was born from his life can help us in facing our contemporary challenges. And today to do that, we have a wonderful panel here so I'll introduce them, and then we'll hear from them. First, Greg Erlinson. He's one of the world's most respected Catholic journalists. He's currently editor-in-chief of the Catholic News Service, overseeing the nation's largest Catholic news agency. For 27 years, he served at Our Sunday Visitor. He's co-author of the book, Pope Benedict XVI and the Sexual Abuse Crisis, Working for Reform and Renewal, published in 2010. He's married and the father of four children. And significantly for our event today, he was the first American to interview Giussani, I think, maybe, in the 1980s. Possibility. It's a possibility. <laughs> okay. He interviewed Father Giussani in 1984-85, and we'll get to hear a little bit about that. Helen Alvare, next to him, is a professor of law at George Mason University, where she teaches family law, law and religion, and property law. She's a consultant for the Pontifical Council of the Laity, an advisor to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and an ABC News consultant. She cooperates with the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations as a speaker, and a delegate to various United Nations conferences concerning women and the family. She's the author of four books, 30 uh, law articles and numerous articles and news outlets. Her most recent book is Putting Children's Interests First in U.S. Family Law, With Power Comes Responsibility, which was published in 2017. She's married and the mother of three young adult children. And to dialogue with our panelists, we're fortunate to have with us a friend and close collaborator of Father Giussani, Alberto Savarana, the author of this large, comprehensive book, um, 
and, and really the book goes through not just Father Giussani's life, but the origin and development of the communal life that sprung from Giussani's life. Alberto has worked as a professional journalist since 1987, including for a time in New York. He was the editor of Trace or Traces, the international monthly magazine of communion and liberation. And currently he's the director of the CL Public Relations and Press Office. So we have quite a panel here with us today. Okay, so we'll start with you, Greg, and then we'll hear from Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I want to start off by just apologizing. I was in Rome for the uh, Sexual Abuse Summit, and uh, on, on, I'm, I'm convinced that on the way back home I got the Alitalia flu. So I, I'm, uh, I may be sniffling every now and then, but, um, but I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, it, it, it's great, it, it's, it's slightly... intimidating honor to have been invited to be on this panel. And I, I want to congratulate uh, Alberto for this encyclopedic work uh, on the life of Don Giussani. I, I've, I've made the joke with some of my Italian friends that instead of being called the life of Luigi Giussani, it should be called three kilos of Luigi Giussani. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an impressive and detailed telling through primary sources of the life and accomplishments of this remarkable priest. Really reading it is, it, uh, it, you just find these little nuggets on practically every page, and, and so much is taken from his writings and his talks. Uh, it, it is truly remarkable. One of the highlights of my journalistic career was the opportunity to interview Don Giussani for the National Catholic Register. In 1984, I went to the meeting at Rimini, which turns out, I found out from the book, was the fifth one that was held. The theme was America, Americas. This was my introduction to CL. To this day, I'm still close friends with the first person I met upon entering the Rimini Fairgrounds, Alessandro Bonfi. He and his wife, Maria, and their family, as well as Lucio Brunelli, Paolo Biondi, Roberto Fontelan, and others have had a powerful and lasting impact on me with their example and their friendship. CL was and remains for me rooted in these encounters or as Giussani might say, bound to the presence of a person. In that sweltering Adriatic heat in late August, I remember being in a huge tent with thousands of young and youngish people, all listening to Hans Urs von Balthasar speaking. In the exhibit hall, there were all sorts of displays, including a video screen with an endless loop of Michael Jackson's Thriller, the hottest video in the world at that moment. Performing in the evening was the Martha Graham Dance Company. I even interviewed Bill Congdon, an artistic contemporary of Jackson Pollock, and a sort of CL rock star. It was an absolutely stunning kaleidoscope of experiences, and I couldn't imagine a similar series of events at any Catholic gathering in the United States. So my first encounter with CL was characterized by openness and friendship, intellectual engagement, and a certain cultural fearlessness. Later, I interviewed Don Giussani in Milan. He discussed some of the history of CL, its stance towards the church and the world, how it compared to other movements, and how its message might be received in the U.S. Interestingly, in light of today's debates, he at one point warned that there are Catholic that where there are Catholic organizations or institutions that lack vitality, quote, there exists the danger of clericalism, and this is the greatest danger today. He also talked about the disruptive spirit of CL as a necessary mortification for the church. Quote, we must rouse the sleeping ones, he told me. 
we must rouse the sleeping ones. Whether we are talking about the needs of Christian education, or about the role of the laity in the church, or about the role of the church in the world, the mission statement of the Christian could be summarized as to rouse the sleeping ones. The religious desolation that Chassani found among the ostensibly Catholic kids at Burchette Public High School in 1954 sparked in him a desire to awaken the faith in these students. Italy's cultural condition at that moment was far different from the United States. In the United States, Catholics were still wondering if one of their own could ever be elected president. Catholic families had begun migrating to the suburbs, and Catholic schools were still teeming with both students and women religious. In Italy, the faith was already sleepwalking into the maw of modernity. Gisani came early to realize what lay evangelists in the United States, like Sherry Waddell, came to see decades later, that God has no grandchildren. What Waddell means by this is that the faith is no longer an inheritance. We are no longer in a position where children remain in the faith because their parents are in the faith. The power of secular culture and competing ideologies are such that the term cradle Catholic lacks meaningful significance. In a sense, we are all either sleepwalkers now or adults who have made a choice. The chapter I found most riveting was 196, it was about 1968, and in some ways I saw that upheaval as having echoes in today's events. The fact that GS was so easily unmoored in the wave of radicalism that swept Italy must have been tremendously unnerving to Giussani. The idea that young Catholics could be led to a discovery of the faith by recovering their intellectual traditions seemed useless at a time when history itself was rejected and a new mankind created in a secularist and ideological laboratory was promised. God was dead, and history as well. Quote, tradition and theory, tradition and reasoning can no longer move the person today, Chisani said. Christianity began as a happening because of a presence, because of an encounter, close quote. The drama of this moment for Chisani is that it drove him back to the encounter with Christ as the starting point. Today has a similar feel Though, in fact, we may still be living in the radioactive half-life of 68. What seems particularly true in our current crisis is that not only have we lost faith in such major institutions as government and universities, but we have also lost faith in the church as an institution. The recent uproar over the continuing sex abuse drama is striking in that both left and right now evince the same kind of anti-institutionalism. They divide the body of Christ into competing tribes, mimicking the identity politics of our public square. This fragmentation leaves our church open to the allure of congregationalism. We retreat to our parish, our movement, our school of community, our prayer group, our book club, and we make that our home, our happy place, our refuge, which Asani calls our religious coziness. <laughs> this ideological congregationalism is a great temptation, born of disillusionment and American Protestant individualism. It is where Chassani's insistence on unity with the bishop is as important, even at times as difficult, for us now, as it was for Jasani. It is also, I think, where we confront both the temptation of ecclesial movements and their saving grace. They can be criticized, and rightly, sometimes rightly so, for pulling the best and the brightest away from the parish. At the same time, ecclesial movements can be a powerful reminder of the church universal that reaches beyond the parochial, that points us to a larger community that is the people of God, the body of Christ. The twin challenge we face today more than ever is for our movements to leap the walls and cross the parochial boundaries while at the same time investing in and strengthening the parish as the basic building block of community in the church. 
we must rouse the sleep sleeping ones. Jasani understood that starts with ourselves and it starts with Christ. My friend Alessandro told me that when Italy legalized abortion, with only 32% of the people voting with the church, Il Sabato, which was a weekly news magazine, ran a headline, Si ricomincia da 32%. We begin again from 32%. Gisani told the editors the headline was wrong. Si ricomincia da uno. We begin again with Christ as the starting point. Cardinal DiNardo gave an important talk at Catholic University of America a few weeks back. It was a reflection on the Pope's letter to the U.S. bishops at the start of their extraordinary January retreat. Pope Francis was calling our bishops to prayer and away from the impulse to focus on managerial mandates and programmatic changes. Evoking Lumen Gentium, he instead called for a new ecclesial season. Donardo pursues this idea, asking what the Holy Spirit might be doing, where he might be leading us at the current moment. Perhaps now we are being called to really respond to the invitation of the Second Vatican Council, 50 years after the fact. He begin, Donardo begins to imagine that in this new ecclesial season, bishops will have to learn new ways to share and delegate their administrative duties and quote, and attend more to their preaching and sanctifying roles, and where the shepherds recognize more fully the charisms of the laity, and encourage the exercise of those gifts for the good of the church, close quote. In this new ecclesial season that has been in labor since Vatican II, the laity will be allowed to, quote, more fully live out their own calling to be priest, prophet, and king. If the Holy Spirit is using the current moment to open the church, sometimes with great force, in Donardo's phrase, then we, the lady, will be asked, in Jasani's words, to mature in our faith. It will demand of us to rouse the sleeping ones, including that which sleeps inside ourselves. It will demand the full and faithful formation of the lay adult Catholic. Such formation has been the institutional Achilles heel of the church, and it is a role that is uniquely suited to movements such as CL. Indeed, while CL's roots extend back to GS and the high school, in many ways where its charism resides is the university and beyond, where there is virtually nothing for the adult Catholic. The movements are particularly suited for this formation because they are themselves missionary witnesses, first and foremost. Their power comes not from program, text, or pedagogy, but from presence. In that powerful quote from Pasolini, if someone has educated you, then they must have done so with their being, not with their speaking. Jasani himself talks about this power. Quote, the shape of Christian action in the world is this, witness. I think this is how Christian adults must be formed in the church being born, by adult men and women who make the Christian life imaginable because of what they have encountered. In Jasani's language, Christianity is not an ideology. It is people who have met Christ. Like Russian nesting dolls, the three challenges presented to us today are interlocking. The strategy for educating a Christian people is a precursor to the laity assuming a greater role in this new ecclesial season. And it is necessary in turn if the church is to engage this unhappy, endlessly restless world. I will end with a conversation I had with my friend Maria Bonfi in Rome recently. I read to her a line of Don Giussani's that Alberto quotes, Giussani is stressing what can only be learned from the Christian tradition. Quote, otherwise, what does it mean to live according to faith, unless faith is something to be wrapped in a perfumed psalm and laid to rest in the nether reaches of the attic? I said how evocative this line was. Maria said that only after all these years in the movement she has come to see that in many ways, Jasani was a poet. 
Many people have said that in this age of crisis, now more than ever, we need saints. I agree. But I think even more we need saints who are poets. Luigi Giussani was one such man. Thank you. Greetings. I would have come just to listen to Greg, and <laughs> even if I wasn't speaking. So thank you for that. It was beautiful. Um, anyone who knows me can tell you that I'm not usually intimidated to speak in front of anyone, anywhere. One time Cardinal O'Malley dragged me in front of 25,000 people at the baseball park in Boston even. But I'm a little bit more intimidated uh, here today. Yes, thanks to you. Seems <laughs> um, People who have been walking with Chisani and his method are here, and they have been walking with him for decades. Uh, uh, years ago, I, I think it was in the mid-90s, maybe late 90s, I heard um, Lorenzo Alpsetti and Paolo Carozza at Notre Dame, and they were talking about the book, The Risk of Education. I bought it, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it uh, in, in my early 40s. And uh, it took me a long time before I stumbled again upon the religious sense, and then it spoke to me like it knew me, and everything that mattered to me, and everything I was worried about. But it came at a later point in my life. It's also intimidating to be here, because this is a really big book. And um, I read a lot. Second time. Second time I've been here. <laughs> but so useful for provoking conversation. I'm going to thank the author by telling us why. I've been traveling. I've had like a presentation a week at some university around the United States for the last couple of months. And I've been carrying the book because it's too big to put in a briefcase or a backpack. And it has provoked many wonderful conversations. <laughs> and really, you have no idea how many people want to know what possibly could be drawing you to read a book that big and schlep it on a plane. So the book itself has been a powerful tool. The other thing is that the book is such an accomplishment for its depth and breadth the number of conversations in which there are these nuggets. You, it's, it's something, and then it's a hundred people's view of that event and that piece of history. And there's something for everybody in these different perspectives. So what an accomplishment. I have exclamation points and stars all throughout most pages, you know, um, and, and notes. It's, it looks like a maniac read the book, which you'll probably come to conclude is true. And it was difficult for me to make a limited and orderly response to such a book. So what I'm going to do is first talk about the experiences that have shaped the person who's reflecting on this book so you can see how I come to Chisani and this book uh, as a person who has some of the things that he engaged as necessary for modern times and some of the, the, the limitations, very much the limitations that the movement hope to overcome, but that I come from. And then I want to zero in on some of the precise things he talked about regarding education, um, because I am an educator. So the experiences that have shaped my person, I mean, generally speaking, someone who is drawn to God is the most interesting question. Yeah, the, Dasani had that so early in high school and at the seminary, the most interesting question there could be. For me, it was, you know, not a straight path to, to a religious vocation, but a back